95% of the 840,000 school buses in America run on diesel. Every day, more than 25 million children and thousands of bus drivers breathe polluted air on the way to and from school from the diesel exhaust. We're going to replace thousands of these with electric school buses that have big batteries underneath and they are good for the climate. I went down Welcome to Canusa Street, a podcast at the intersection of the issues and policies between Canada and the United States. Here are your hosts, Scotty Greenwood and Chris Sands. Welcome back to Canusa Street, everybody. I'm Scotty Greenwood with the Canadian American Business Council, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, Chris Sands, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Hey, Chris. Hi, Scotty. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well, my friend. Well, listen, uh, the Climate Summit in Glasgow is happening as we're recording this podcast, and what better topic, really, to think about here in North America is electric vehicles. You know, this is the the transition um, from the carbon economy to a lower and lower carbon economy is top of mind everywhere in the world right now. And so I'm excited about our two guests. And uh, we've got a Canadian and an American perspective on EVs. And Chris, why don't I turn it over to you to introduce them properly? Oh, wonderful. Well, thanks, Scotty. And I'm excited. I, I think from Canusa Street to EV Street, we are, it's not quite easy street, but it's getting close and we've got great guests today. So, um, we have with us Nate Baggio, uh, who has been working in the transportation industry for over 30 years. He's with Lion Electric Company now, which is an electric company for that makes buses and, uh, and other larger vehicles. So a big piece of the EV equation. We also have David Patterson, who is Vice President of Corporate and Environmental Affairs with General Motors of Canada. And... Uh, uh, General Motors, as you know, in both Canada and the U.S., really a big leader on uh, electric vehicles, particularly for the consumer market and the fleet sales. So very excited to have both of them with us um, Yeah, and to talk to some knowledgeable people about an important subject. All right. So let's get right into it. I'm going to ask, Chris and I are just going to go back and forth if you guys don't mind. So David, let's start with you. And we should probably disclose to our viewers that you are on the board of directors of the Canadian American Business Council. So you and I have, I have the fortunate chance to uh, talk to you and learn from you on a regular basis. So glad to have you. Let's get right into it. General Motors has said that electric vehicles will be a significant part of the com- company's future. And I think I read that you've, you're you going to offer 30 new electric vehicles by 2025. So maybe you can talk to us about what this transition to zero emission vehicles looks like for General Motors. And um, And yeah, let's start with that. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all in, uh, and in fact, you know what we have said is that uh, that our intention is to uh, is to have our entire light duty fleet electric by 2035, and uh, we have an awful lot of work to do to get electric cars on the road. Um, so we have a real lineup of uh, really amazing cars that are coming out at a very quick uh, clip right now. Um, and that's really good for Canada too. We're going to be the first company uh, in Canada to manufacture um, high volume electric vehicles um, in uh, in sort of the traditional auto sector. Um, our plant in Ingersoll, uh, Ontario, will be converted next year, and uh, our Bright Rock product, which is the first new brand for GM in many years, is going to manufacture uh, all electric uh, cargo vans um and you you just think about the volume of delivery of parcels um uh, that uh, we've seen during covid and what a huge industry that is we have a little bit of canadian technology that's uh, gone into bright drop as well which uh, was sort of developed in our canadian technology center tested on the streets of toronto and uh, this mechanism for delivery uh, we worked with fedex our first big customer and they were able to cut their delivery time sort of somewhere 25 to 30%. So think about that from a business perspective. What does it mean to improve your efficiency in that percentage in an industry that is a multi-trillion dollar industry around the world and do it all electric as well? So we're really excited about that. Um, and uh, But it's not just us. There's other car makers in Canada that are also going electric. 
a little later than us, but, um, uh, you know, it's an exciting change. And so it, it goes right back to home and uh, it's not just, you know, batteries and uh, change in that area. It's lots of software, et cetera. So um, it's, uh, you know, North America it, it, in the car business, it's a North American industry, you know, right back since the 1960s. And uh, this is the biggest change since we left horses behind about a hundred years ago. So uh, <laughs> this is uh, pretty exciting. Some of us still ride horses, but we don't we don't commute to work on them. So yeah, <laughs> what I one of the things I love about this episode, Chris, is that we've got David Patterson, who's in Canada, uh, working for a, a company that started in the U.S., and we have Nate, who's in L.A., uh, but working with a Canadian company. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to Nate. I want to come back to you, David. I want to talk about critical minerals and supply chains and all of that stuff. But let's let's let Nate get in here. And we're not just talking about cars, but we're talking about school buses. And, and you know, this week in Washington, um, infrastructure is being debated, voted, not voted, et cetera, and build back better. President Biden recently said that 95% of U.S. school buses actually run on diesel. And that in his framework, he wants investments into battery-powered electric school buses why do you think he finds this transition so important? And, and what role does your company, uh, which as Chris said, is based in Canada, play as a, an electric vehicle supplier? Well, I, I don't think it's just important to President Biden, but I'm, I'm glad it is important to him. Uh, you know, I've been in the transportation business, uh, you know, as Chris mentioned, for over 30 years, and uh, I haven't heard of a U.S. president directly address the American people about school buses. So, you know, when Lyon brought the first modern lithium-ion electric school bus to the U.S. market, uh, we were the first to do so. You know, there were some other fledgling attempts in the past, but this is really the platform and the technology that's being adopted. And, uh, and these buses have been on the road for five years, you know, six years, 8 million miles worth of service. So it's, it's not an experiment or a pilot. Uh, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, this mode of electric mobility is working and, and it's a real thing. And to David's point, this is a turning point in history. Uh, we can all see it. We're all a part of it. Uh, in 100 years, uh, we have been transporting goods and people and, you know, children a certain way. And right now today in our lifetime, what we're all witnessing and participating in is a significant change in the way we do things. This is a history making moment. And uh, Lion is committed to this. We're 100% EV. We don't build anything else. Um, and uh, we started with a school bus and we're probably most known for that. However, you know, we are an EV company in the medium and heavy duty market, and it's refuse trucks. It is dry box class eight delivery trucks. It's big rigs, drayage trucks coming out of the ports that can take things from a port of entry to a distribution center a few times a day, uh, removing these dangerous emissions from some of the most polluted corridors uh, in, our, in North America, not just the United States, but Canada as well. That's a that's a really important point. And I know we were talking about history. It was we're coming up on a year since President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau had their vir first virtual bilateral. I think that was historic by itself, but they agreed on a roadmap um back in February that included a commitment to build necessary supply chains to make Canada and the U.S. global leaders in all aspects of battery development and production. So I, I want to ask about that. And Particularly, um, I'll start with you, David. Why, how do transnational supply chains uh, feed into the value chain for General Motors and the vehicles you make, particularly on the battery side? Because I know you make some of your own batteries, you have partners on, on others. So how is, uh, how is that working for you and how important is battery, the battery as a piece of this equation? Well, it really is the, the critical technology change. And uh, just as GM uh, owns its en engine plants and its transmission plants today, uh, moving forward, the battery is really um, a critical thing. E electric motors as well. So we're going to own that. And uh, we're going to own our chemistry in terms of battery development. We're, we're partnering together with uh, LG Chem, uh, but we're uh, in the course of um, starting to build uh, four major battery plants in the United States, one in Ohio, one in Tennessee, two to be named. 
Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about it, in the industry, we sell about $17 million or million vehicles a year. Um, so that's the, the, the big purchase um, right there in terms of batteries. If all those cars move over, as they will, to electric in the next decade, boy, that's a lot of batteries. And, you know, these are, these are sizable batteries. And uh, so we're going to need an awful lot of minerals, and we're going to need to process those minerals. Uh, right now, battery technology for electric vehicles has really been led in Asia for the last decade, China, um, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of the sourcing coming from Indonesia, the Philippines, um, for, for the critical minerals that are needed. And so we need a good range of minerals to, to make not just batteries, but uh, electric motors, that have magnets, and all kinds of precious minerals that go into them. And it just happens that some of those uh, key minerals that we're going to need lots and lots of Really, the only major place in North America that you can source those is Canada. And so, um, you know, we can do a lot in the United States and, and the like. But uh, I think the for all kinds of good reasons, from security to um, just what we've learned about how great it is to be localized during COVID, um, that bringing that supply chain and making it sustainable um, into North America is is one of the things that goes with this shift to electric vehicles. So right now you've got a relatively small percentage of electric vehicles being sold, but that's going to change. And so we have to get the uh, the supply chains uh, sorted out. And to me, that spells opportunity with a capital O. And uh, and so especially for Canada. And and so I think our Prime Minister and and uh, President Biden were wise and early to get this uh, very high on the, uh, the agenda because, you know, we build things together in North America and we can, uh, as we make this technological shift, uh, really have a more sustainable, more environmentally beneficial uh, supply chain and boy, we could create some big jobs too. Hey, if I can just follow up on this question for a second, David, on, on, on critical minerals processing, because you're right you know, China actually, I think, owns 80% of the processing in the world for, for these critical minerals and rare earths. So the whole world is really reliant at the moment. And the, and the processing of them is, is, is toxic if you, if you don't do it right. It's, it's, and if you do do it right, it's expensive, right? To, to, so we have to do it right in North America. We want to do it right, whether that's from an environmental point of view or labor standards or whatever. How do you, what we worry about is how do you make it economic um, for private industry to invest in a jurisdiction like Canada or the United States for processing for something that is, are huge investments and could be stopped by a protest, by a regulatory procedure? Like, how, you know, how do you compete with China? How do you how do you give any kind of certainty that we can build a project again uh, here in North America? Do you worry about that? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I sort of smile because I spend all my life worrying about a process being stopped by a protest or a regulatory. In, can you imagine regulation in the auto sector? I mean, my God, I mean, we have so many layers of regulation, uh, uh, regulation on regulation on regulation. Uh, it is a miracle anyone ever puts a vehicle on the road at all. Um, so we do need to be able to think um uh, in, in really smart regulatory ways in terms of how these things go on. And I know Nate's going to be able to talk about this too, because Quebec, where uh, Lion is based, is I think a real leader in some of the, the advantages here. And, and uh, one of those is, uh, you know, I'm always surprised how few Americans realize what a low GHG grid we have in Canada, and particularly Quebec and BC. I mean, you know, it's all hydropower in Quebec. And so you've got zero GHGs, you've got the lowest cost of electricity effectively on the continent. And uh, that's one of the, the sort of key advantages there. And then if you dig into, I was on the phone with friends in the mining industry this morning, and, you know, we can really be proud of the, the leadership that Canada has on not only sustainable mining practices, and that's partly regulatory, but it's also just being a leader, traceability 
of uh, minerals as well. And, you know, this will bring us into blockchain and, and things like that too. So, you know, we are uh, uh, the best in the world at being able to do these things. And uh, just like batteries, the biggest thing with batteries, we've got to cut the cost in half. Uh, that's technology, that's innovation. And uh, that's what we do. Nate, David mentioned about Quebec and it's, it sort of makes me think about, you know, I chose my parents really well. Uh, you know, and I think I think it, industries from Quebec really did well by uh, being blessed with this plentiful hydropower. How how do you think about your supply chain, inclu- including your electricity and power inputs, but also the the rest of the supply chain that you use? What how much of it is North American? How do you guys sort of think about those things? Well, like most folks, you know, as as David mentioned, we are depending on production out of Asia for batteries today. But that's not the long-term plan. Uh, Like GM and other forward-thinking companies, uh, Lion is also going to be manufacturing its own batteries. And uh, and that is going to evolve in, um, you know, the the minerals being sourced uh, from North America, not just Canada, but the U.S. as well. And, you know, the other good point uh, that both of you bring up is that when you look at how a Lion truck or a Lion bus is being built today, it's with, uh, you know, zero emission energy, you know, with, all, with through Hydro Quebec. And, you know, why that's important across the continent is you're seeing places like Illinois, where there's a lot more manufacturing. Uh, they're working on passing legislation now that is going to clean up their grid. So they're following that lead started by Quebec and Canada and and BC as well um, to build these with a clean grid. And um, there are a number of things that resonate here in the United States, having control, having local control of the energy that goes in to building your vehicles and also charging those vehicles to run. So it's your own grid, it's local supply, and you can determine how clean that is going to be state by state or community by community, even in some cases. So it gives control um, uh, of the actual power source that's going to make your economy drive. So it literally, literally. So, you know, when you look at supply chain and when you look at emerging dedicated EV companies like Lion, we've even taken it a step uh, further and have made our technology battery agnostic. So if there are fluctuations, as there are uh, with sources of batteries, we can make that change. Uh, However, eventually we will be making our own batteries and and we'll be much more in control of how we do that. And largely building them in Canada, but we're also looking at doing this in the US as well. Uh, We have the, you know, a million square feet of medium and heavy duty EV manufacturing happening in Joliet, Illinois. Uh, and, and there are other facilities popping up in the U.S. as well uh, in order to keep up with the demand we're seeing. Um, it, it, let me jump in on that because I, I always think about now we, that we're thinking about sustainability, there, there's something of a life cycle here. And I, I, in talking about critical minerals, we have limited supplies, etc. I wonder if either of you can talk a little bit about uh, recycling. Uh, the batteries at the end of the process. I know some of that lithium, some of those other things can be reprocessed and you still get some value out of it. What are we doing about the end of the life cycle? I know that (laughs) that's hopefully down the road quite a bit, but are we thinking about that now as we starting to bring more and more batteries into our our vehicle fleet? One of the important things to consider, if I can jump in, David, um, is that when you're, you're building, designing and sourcing your own batteries, um, you're also getting to control the, the the duty cycle of that battery and its total use because there you, you have a battery that uh, stores and discharges ener- energy, and then it has a secondary use of powering a vehicle. Um, and at some point, a battery will degrade to the point where maybe that vehicle operator doesn't want that battery in that vehicle anymore. There is a third life that is stationary storage with solar panels, wind energy, all of the other clean, clean, sustainable energy generators will now be able to use those batteries for another 10 to 15 years on top of their original duty cycle. So, you know, when you're talking about companies like Lion and, and GM, it's when you're, you're designing your own, it's not just controlling your own supply chain, but it's controlling the end use and the second, third, fourth life of that battery and how it can be used. 
and and you know 95 percent of the materials are recyclable so you know you can recover these things and uh turn them into batteries all over again or battery storage microgrid technology there's a number of things you can do which i think just really cements how much better for the planet this technology is and why it's it's inevitable this is happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to yeah. build on that a little bit too because uh you know we we've had our electric vehicles in the market certainly in canada for over a decade and they still are running um you know the batteries will outlast the cars and uh and so and to nate's point uh when there is uh, a time to finally retire that electric vehicle, the battery is going to be a valuable resource for reuse. And so like in our sort of hierarchy of environmental, you know, it's better to reuse before you recycle. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there will be whole industrial businesses and our companies will will jump into these to take those batteries out and uh, use them in our plants uh, because many of them will have like 70% life left in them um, if they've been uh, properly used, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, a big aspect of what we do in our plants in Ontario, for instance, is uh, use batteries at night to store up electricity when electricity is cheap and then use it during the day. And that brings our costs down. And, uh, you know, there are people that are selling secondary batteries for, uh, for wall units in your house. And our electric vehicles are such that, uh, funny enough, you know, you'll be able to charge up your battery. Some people will use that battery during the week, but it'll be sitting in your driveway and you can plug your house into it. So you now have a generator on wheels and uh, it may be more effective because you charged up at night for lower things to during the day, run your air conditioners off of your truck. Um, so, you know, this is changing the way that we, that we work. And uh, we have a little bit of a public policy challenge right now with, for example, the province of Quebec, which, um, uh, is jumping quickly in terms of trying to recycle and create its own uh, uh, sort of environment for recycling and basically saying we want to pluck your batteries out at 10 years. They're not ready to be taken out at 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, what you're going to do if you do that, if you understand the car industry, is you're going to kill the residual values of the vehicles. If uh, the car is suddenly dead at 10 years, that's going to actually make it harder to buy your next car because you use the value in your existing car to get you into the next one. And then that's going to hurt your ability to sell electric cars in Quebec. So it's actually a policy thing that at first you think this is great. We're going to have, you know, forced recycling and it's going to kill your electric vehicle business. And so there's a dialogue that is going to need to take place in terms of public policy. And I don't mean to, to poke at Quebec because lots of local areas are, are, are starting to try and say, how are we going to figure this out? Is there a, you know, can we use the, the substances that are in these batteries and, uh, and that, that'll reduce the mining that we have to do? And those are all good questions to have. But, um, but sometimes we need a dialogue before we regulate, and uh, um, that's going to be part of the, the challenge going forward. Well, we're all about dialogue. So, you know, um, it's, it's always good to raise issues in a, in a forthright, you know, uh, way, bringing the facts to the table. So no, no worries there. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll continue the conversation. We're, we're coming close to the, to the end of our time, but I, I want to, before I turn it over to my really smart colleague who's going to ask challenging questions, let me ask a really dumb one. Um, I, d- I don't drive an electric vehicle today. So, um, uh, I, I'd like to, um, but how, how far do they, what's the state of the technology today? Like how far can you go or how long does it last? Cause it seems like, it seems like we've also got to get uh, a lot of charging stations deployed before I can road trip to my place in Vermont for here, from here in Washington. What's the, what's the state of the state of the technology today for both of you guys? You're, you know, it, it varies a little bit. The, the Chevrolet bolts, uh, over 400 kilometers of range. Uh, on a charge and you, you know, you get 600 in some vehicles, um, which is going to get you to the cottage and back in many instances. Um, but the biggest impediment, I think, in the next 10 years is funny enough, um, you know, the, the industry's all in. We're all moving electric. It's bringing customers along. It's the, it's helping consumers to make the change. And there's two big things that we need. One is 
we need to have um, some help because of the higher cost of electric vehicles. And so incentives are an active issue right now. And, you know, we've got to keep up in Canada with the, the size of incentives being offered in the States now. And the second thing is the charging network. And we got to keep up there too. We're behind. And, uh, and so there are some very ambitious investments taking place in those two areas. And that will make the difference as to whether this works. Um, so there are some things we have to do in, in the industry and there's some things government has to do. And so unlike the old kind of dialogue of we'll regulate you to do this, well, you've got to do some things too. And, uh, and so we are turning that conversation back on our friends in government and saying, hey, where's the chargers? Right. And I, I think one of the other things, and we started off this conversation talking about how this is a turning point in history. We are changing history, which means you need to change behaviors, which means you need to change perception. Um, you know, in, in both cars in my household are electric. Uh, and, you know, and admittedly, even though I'm in the EV industry, I was nervous. You know, it's like, well, what if I need to go way over there? You know, or what if I need to drive for four hours, you know, which I never do. Uh, and, and I was constantly plugging my car in at home and uh, charging it. And you just don't need to do that. It, it's, I think when people get a little bit more comfortable with what they're actually using their vehicles for, you'll find that adoption is, is increasing exponentially. And, and just a, a heavy duty example, the average school bus route is between 50 and 65 miles a day. We have a 155 mile range on a school bus right now. So, you know, most of our customers don't even charge the school bus every day. You don't have to. So it's, uh, you know, I think for most duty cycles, you know, you know, the refuse trucks, 90 miles a day, we can do 250. Dredge trucks, one of the busiest ports in the United States in Los Angeles, from the port to distribution sites are 60 miles away. So you can do that more than once back and forth all day. Uh, and, and when you really look at what you're using these vehicles for, you know, are there one-offs where you want to drive across the country? Sure. But, you know, 80% of your trips, EV more than handles uh, what people are doing with these vehicles today. Well, well, as soon as there's enough charging stations between uh, between Arlington, Virginia and uh, Lake Memphis, Vermont, I will be right there with you. And Nate, I'm I'm glad that the uh, the big trucks at the ports, you know, can have that kind of range because it's not just all day; it's going to be all night now, right? We're trying to we're trying to alleviate supply chain crunch, which is a um, that's a different topic for Canusa Street. Uh, but Chris, maybe I'll give it to you for the last question, and we'll have a wrap up for our guest. Uh, this is this is enlightening as always, and uh, uh, and I do feel a little guilty um, ab about my my uh regular vehicle so i'll have to think about it but i feel good about the horses so i was trying to make you feel guilty <laughs> well done <laughs> well be be yeah i don't want to break up this moment of guilt um but uh to, to ask a slightly different question I you mentioned early on just the the blessings of Canada, you know, great natural resources, great hydropower resources. Those are real strengths. And I often think the the counterpoint blessing of the U.S. is just a really big market and a lot of people. And so when the two work together, that's fantastic. Um, and we've had the auto pact since 1965 and a lot of trade agreements to allow us to get continental scale on things. And then we start talking in Washington about building back better and buy American. And I, I, as all of the things that we can do um, with government to try to incentivize this transition, I wonder if, if each of you could reflect a little bit um, on how Buy American, you know, kind of runs into that. Is it is it a big problem or is it something that we can work around? Is there room for Buy North American? Because it, it just seems that we're, we're giving up a huge advantage if we put a, you know, a wall in between our supply chains because we're only willing to subsidize on this side or that. But let me let me start with you, Nate, and then and then see what David's thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think overall what we're seeing is a big push for things to come back to North America. Um, you know, there there has been a, a narrative of bringing manufacturing back to the United States, especially in the transportation market. And, um, you know, we're building in both Canada and the U.S. Again, as I mentioned, we're building a significant factory in Joliet, Illinois, 
to meet the demand in the U.S. But when, you know, Line Electric, for example, we were just having this conversation. When you look at the purchasing power we're going to have in North America, the impact that's going to have on supply chain, uh, our pricing, and, uh, you know, also our reinvestment in R&D, um, that's happening, you know, in the U.S. It's happening in, in, in even more so in Canada right now. Um, that I, I don't see it being a problem. You know, you're going to have to have manufacturing amenities in the U.S. in order to serve that market. You know, California alone has a bigger GDP uh, than most countries, and uh, and the demand is there as well as well as the regulation. So. You know, you're going to have to buy a build in, on both sides of the border, regardless. Um, and when you look at w where the purchasing is happening, uh, it, it's you know we just had a, a thousand bus uh, purchase order uh, in Canada. So the, the the volumes are being driven north of the border. So there is certainly a valuable connection to that. To, to what is what is happening on the U.S. side as well as far as the impact on our pricing and and supply chain and in our volumes, uh, it's only going to benefit the market as a whole. David, is, is it same for GM? Well, I, you know, fifty years of uh, building things together in the auto sector. You know, parts going across the border seven times before they get put into a, a plant uh, north of the border or south of the border. We are so integrated right now that unscrambling those eggs is something that I don't know how to do. Uh, and there is an awful lot of, uh, of the portion of what goes into a car that's got nothing to do with it being electric. You still need seats, you still need steel, you still need new advanced products. And, and boy, do you need a lot of technology, by the way, as well. I mean, one of our largest areas of growth in GM Canada is in software. Uh, and, you know, major new test tracks so that our software engineers can can put their code on the road. Um, you know, that's going to be a critical part of electric cars as well, because you got to manage the battery systems. And uh, and so, you know, we are already a very integrated uh, market two ways. Uh, we're investing a couple billion dollars in our plants in Canada right now. Um, you know, this is going in a pretty good direction. It's no surprise after uh, the years and years that we've had of trade uh, and globalization that there is a desire for people to bring things more at home, especially after COVID. And uh, we've learned from that. And so this is an opportunity. What, what can we do? Uh, but we, we're a block. In the auto sector, there's North America, there's Europe, and there's Asia. And our block's the wealthiest and uh, the richest uh, in resources. Um, boy, what an opportunity as we shift technology. What a what a great place to what a great place to to end this. I I just want to say thank you um, to Nate and to David uh, for joining us for teaching us a little bit about um, about the future, but also about where we are now and some and some of the policy challenges that that still remain. Even even with all of the goodwill and the vigor and the desire, there's still there's still some work to do uh, in our conversations uh, with governmental leaders. So we'll. We appreciate you sharing that with us as well. And and we'll be uh, we'll be trying to install some charging stations so that we can have uh, cars and buses running on Canusa Street, uh, fully ready to go. Uh, we want to improve our Canusa environment as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's good to see you, Nate and uh, Chris and and Scotty. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this conversation. Well, Chris, usually I say I'm fired up. I guess right now I'm going to say I'm all charged up. I learned a lot about EVs today, electric vehicles. And, uh, you know, I said it in the piece, but it's, it's pretty cool to have a Canadian working for an American company and a, and an American, uh, working for a Canadian company, a guy in LA working for a Quebec company. So this is just all, um, all very interesting. And, and it's not, inevitable. It's not done. What I learned today is when it comes to the carbon transition, there are an awful lot of policy decisions and business decisions that will impact how quickly we get there. Well, and yeah, I agree. And I think one of the important points that came out of this was the importance of dialogue. It, it's so easy to think of an electric vehicle the way we think of our car, it just have a different power source. But actually, things like how long the battery lo uh, lasts are different. And 
so you always think you buy a car, it starts losing value the day it comes off the lot. Well, maybe the battery depreciates at a different rate than the rest of the vehicle. So there are all sorts of things where you have to adjust our expectations, adjust our paradigms, because this is transportation, but it's not your father's old mobile uh, in an electric form. So I think that that's really important for people to start understanding and talking about because it's going to be a different kind of auto industry, but uh, a better one. That's exactly right. Well, look, there's a, there is a lot more to come when we talk about uh, manufacturing in North America, when we think about uh, supply chains and electric vehicles and what it all means. So I look forward to keep keep keeping on keeping on here, keeping on trucking and bussing and driving, Chris. This is a this is an important conversation. I'm glad we I'm glad we got it started here on Canusa today. Me too, and and we'll keep horses in the mix as well because I know you, I know you like horses, and uh, I just like horsing around. So uh, that's right. Well, you know I'm going to work in a, an equestrian reference in every point. That may, maybe that's going to be a drinking game for somebody. How long does it take before? Scotty Greenwood brings up her damn horses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know what kind of drinking games my students would come up for me with for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really good. We'll see you next time, Chris. All right. Thanks, Scotty. This podcast is brought to you by the Canadian American Business Council and the Wilson Center. If you like this episode, help others find our show and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify.